You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Welcome to Roberta Glass True Crime Report. I'm Lisa O'Brien, sitting in for Roberta for this episode. Joining me today is Tim Sparkman, a former member of the Bastrop Sheriff's Office and current Bastrop County Constable. And we're talking about one of the most egregious and longest running innocence fraud cases in the media. And that's the innocence claims made on behalf of Texas death row inmate Rodney Reed. Reed was linked to the April 23rd, 1996 murder of bride-to-be Stacy Stites when DNA from Stacy's body was matched to Reed in the spring of 1997. Since 2001, attorneys for the Innocence Project have argued in the courts and to the media that the irrefutable DNA evidence is unrelated to the murder and the real killer, quote, unquote, is Stacy Stites' fiance, Jimmy Fennell, a former Texas police officer. Good evening, Tim. How are you tonight? Just fine. How are you? Very well. I'm happy to be doing this for Roberta. Let's get started on Rodney Reed. Well, there's so much to go over. If if you want to start from the beginning, but maybe (laughs) we'll start from the from the end and go back a little bit. Yeah. Well, right now we are still waiting on the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals to decide whether to grant relief on Reed's 10th post-conviction writ, which was filed in 2019 to stave off his execution. Yes. And we are also waiting for the Court of Criminal Appeals to decide whether to allow Reed to pursue claims in the 11th writ which was filed in 2021, shortly after post-conviction hearings, alleging new Brady violations regarding relationship evidence. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, because those claims are portrayed as being strong, but they're really not. No, they're basically claiming the same old, same old. They're basically claiming that the cops didn't tell them about rumors when Reed's original trial attorneys have said, well, we talked to AGB employees who confirmed everything Rodney Reed told us. So how can the police withhold information that you got directly from AGB employees? Now, and when you say AGB employees, are you talking about Cardenas? Hugan, Cardenas, Haas, and Coronado. Yeah. Yeah. From, from what I understand, I, I don't know this exactly, but looking at, you know, the past notes and stuff, all of them have been interviewed and all of them have recanted or denied saying anything. What Reed's attorneys have done, first of all, with Haas, they have a statement that they found in notes prepared by the DA's office or the, the AG's office prior to Reed's criminal trial 98 that say Ron Haas heard rumors about Reed visiting Stacy in the store or something to that effect. Well, yeah. that's not Ron Haas saying, I saw Reed visiting Stacy. Yeah. Rumors. And you got to remember, in the court of public opinion, it's totally different than the court of law in the trial mm-hmm. room being under oath. I do know for a fact that when rumors come out, the investigators back then and the prosecutors and stuff were very diligent about any time they heard or thought they heard anybody who had any kind of information regarding the case, they sent investigators out to interview them and, and ask yeah. them, hey, okay, so we hear through the grapevine that you got some information. We would love to hear it. I have to give them props. They went out trying to find anybody who could mm-hmm. dispel what <laughs> the, what they right. thought was true and what, what they had evidence of. They're like, if there's some evidence and you know, they just weren't like, okay, we don't want to hear anything that is anti our case. They, which, is, which is how they're portrayed, and that's wrongly. Yeah. Wrong and that's very done. wrong. And and the people who were involved in this on the prosecutor side and law enforcement side were more than ethical, more than competent and did a great job. Yeah. Still I doing agree. it to this day. The right. Same people that have been working on this since 1998 are still working on it. Yeah. It's amazing. And that's something too. Cardenas and Coronado demonstrate that. The statement from Cardenas was Jose Coronado told me Reed used to visit Stacy in the store. Yeah. They went to Coronado and Coronado actually said, I never said that. I didn't tell him that. I know nothing yeah. about 
this guy and Stacy. And personally, this is my own opinion. I believe that once Reed was arrested, his relatives and his friends and family were coming into HB and saying, you saw Rodney Reed talking to Stacy Stites all the time and trying yeah, to I, plant those seeds. Yeah, I don't even know if it was once he was arrested. I think it was more closer to the trial. That's where they based it on, you know, because when right. he first got arrested, even Rodney said, I don't know that girl. I've mm -hmm. never seen her before. He sat down in front of David Board. David Board was very professional, very thorough. He did a, an excellent job interviewing Rodney. Mm -hmm. And they got him in the interview room. He wanted to ask him a couple questions about Stacy, And he said, I don't know that girl. And signed a, he was not under duress. David did an excellent job yeah. of interviewing him. And, you know, this is your, your chance. Tell me if you know her. And he's like, he said, I do, I do not know her. I've never met her. Mm -hmm. I've seen her picture in the paper. And back right. then, the Bastrop advertiser came out on Thursdays. And by Thursday night, Friday morning, everybody had a new paper. And very often, there was a picture of Stacy on the front page with a $50,000 reward for any information that right. would possibly lead to let us know. We're, we're stumped. We don't know. It's almost a year. We can't solve it. We need right. the public's help. And if one person would have come forward and whispered the name Rodney Reed to somebody at the advertiser or to an investigator before the Linda Schluter case came out, mm -hmm. they would be $50,000 richer. Right. Exactly. You've heard the conversation between David Board and the woman who didn't want to identify herself, who said that her son was having an affair with Stacy. No. I are you? Are you uh, it's, it was David Campos. And there was a caller, an anonymous caller, and he called her and trying to get the son's name and trying to get more yeah. information. And she was convinced her son was having an affair with Stacy. In that call, if you listen to it, Campo says at one point, we think that is the boyfriend's motive. So they're not looking to pin it on the person Stacy was having the alleged affair with. They're looking for motive for Jimmy Fennell. And uh, for anybody who says Fennell wasn't looked at is just... They're yeah, lying. they looked at him for, for a year. Yeah. Trust me, they were pretty thorough with Fennell. And everybody's like, yeah, but he failed a polygraph. I'm like, was he just deceptive on some of the questions? You know, the polygraphs, there's a reason they're not admissible in court. Right. You, you just lost your fiance. There's a bunch of guilt going on and you're being asked questions as a cop. Yeah. And you're like, mm, my instinct is if he had anything to do with it, he wouldn't have spoken to anybody. Mm -hmm. He would probably and, invoke from day one. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, on a personal note, I've been around a long time. I, I'm from Bastrop. I went to high school here. I, I know a lot of people here. I, I've raised my family here and worked at the sheriff's office since 99. But I know most of the investigators and most of the, the policemen and the Texas Ranger and prosecutors and stuff who are all involved mm -hmm. in this. I've heard the theory. Jimmy found out and he got mad and he murdered her. And they're all like, we're going to frame this Rodney Reed for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me as a cop, here's my first question. If you're going to frame somebody, why didn't you go park her car in his driveway? Why you park it a quarter mile away? If you're going to frame somebody, why are you going to let it go for almost a year before they, exactly. they find out? If you're going to frame you, somebody, you know what the DNA is going to be. Why don't you go yeah. pick them up the day her body is found? Yeah. You What's know? the holdup? Now, granted, these people are thorough and they were good at their job and they're good at everything. That, but there's, you know, multiple agencies involved in this between 96 and 98, multiple agencies. And it was traditional for something big like this for the Texas Rangers to step in and help the, the outlying areas, the outposts that they would assign them. At. Mm -hmm. They have access to the lab. They have access to all the, the cool stuff. I'm telling you. The people involved in this from day one could never have pulled that off. There's no right. way. I worked with most of them until just recently. They could not have pulled that off. They're not that smart. You would have had to have been ridiculously meticulous. First of all, her mom's got to be in on it because she's the last person to see her alive. She said, what, 8.30, 9 o'clock. She was in flip-flop shorts and a T-shirt bouncing around with Jimmy, and they were heading upstairs. They went upstairs, and then what? Five, six o'clock the next morning, her boss is calling and said she didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the theories coming from New York and all the people who are on salary for the Innocence Project. You know, like Cyril Wick is one of the smartest dudes around, but he gets paid a lot of money by the Innocence Project. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you ain't telling the Innocence Project what they want to hear, they're not going to pay you. Exactly.
and I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm not saying anything, but his theory on how she died and the, the autopsy report and all that kind of stuff. You know, I've been to a thousand autopsies, you know, I've been to all that stuff. And I'm like, there's no way he could have read Barlow's report and came up with this theory of she was dead way before. So her mom's got to be in on it. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the evidence and all the stuff coming up, so let me get this straight. Dr. Phil and all the Innocence Project want us to believe that Jimmy murdered her in their apartment, whether she was drowned, which dispels the drowning thing. I don't even remember who said that. That was something that wasn't all that long ago. She was drowned in her apartment or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's why she had an e extra amount of fluid in her lungs. That's Kevin Gannon. So, okay, so if he drowned her in her bathtub, how is Reed's saliva still on her chest and neck and stuff at the autopsy? So that dispels the drowning thing. And then these guys, Jimmy Fennell, and I don't know, I think they said Curtis Davis. They were thought Curtis might have went over there and helped Jimmy because Jimmy couldn't have pulled this off on his own. Right. But they think he had help because, first of all, how do you get back to his apartment? She was in shorts, T-shirt, 9.30, 9 o'clock at night. And sometime right after that, she was murdered. But she was found in her H-E-B clothes. Mm -hmm. And when she was found, every day she wore a, a knee brace on her knee. So these guys who murdered this girl, and they're in haste. They're panic mode. They're trying to figure this out. Okay, we got to get her dressed in her H-E-B clothes, and we got to put her in the car, and we got to take her over there, and we got to we got to set this scene up and do everything like that. They were so meticulous when they dressed her that in that knee brace, they even rolled up tissue paper and shoved it down next to her knee so that brace didn't rub on her kneecap. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just throw the brace on and put her pants on over it and put her tennis shoes on and do her hair, you know, all that stuff. I mean, remember, she's supposed to be dead and they're supposed to have dressed her in her H-E-B uniform, went out and staged this and then got a ride back, went and parked the car, got a ride back. They talked about this on the Dr. Phil show. Yeah. She was dead. Fennell team must have staged this. And I'm like, even the best serial killer in the world, the BTK killer and all these, these guys were not that meticulous. Mm -hmm. They did it constantly, constantly trying to hide their tracks. They want us to believe that in the haste, they were so detailed that they remembered to roll up tissue and put it in her knee brace. Because mm -hmm. it's in evidence. Pieces yeah. of tissue found in her knee brace on the body. Yeah. That tells me right there, 100%, she put that knee brace on. She rolled up the tissue and put it in. Now, my personal theory, and has been since day one, if you're familiar with Bastrop, when you come down 21 from the Giddings area, you're going to cross 95, and the first thing you're going to run into is a set of railroad tracks. I think one of Reed's cousins or something said that they had been out partying together and, and they were at their mom's house and he walked home mm -hmm. about the same time she was coming through. And if he's walking down the railroad tracks, if you know what I'm talking about, between the high school and Chestnut Street and you're walking down the tracks and a train is coming towards you, the only thing you can do is step off the tracks to the left about 20 feet and that's Fayette Street. And it runs from the parking lot of the high school and it goes straight to Chestnut. And then if you cross Chestnut just a little bit, you, you got to go back over the tracks and cross and just look jog. It turns into MLK, which is where Rodney lived, mm -hmm. like one block off of Chestnut. If he's on his way home, walking down the railroad tracks, and a train is coming, which was common back then. I remember working patrol, and you know you couldn't go through town because there was a train going through there yeah. for 20 minutes. That's just my theory. If there was a train coming, and she was stopped at that train, on her way down Chestnut, Rodney would have walked straight into her truck. And if you look at the autopsy report, she probably didn't have her door locked. I mean, we don't know. There's no forced entry or nothing. The window's not broken. She probably didn't have her door locked. She probably never saw him walk up to the car, walk around the back of it. He opens her door, and she's got a huge bruise contusion on the left side of her head. Mm -hmm. Even the autopsy says as she was punched by a large fisted person. My theory is he saw this girl, opens the door, punches her, knocks her out, shoves her over the center console, climbs in, turns around. In his words, he said, last time I saw her, we had sex in the state park. If you mm -hmm. make a U-turn and go straight back up the hill, you run into the entrance of the state park. He probably pulled in there, did the deed. Now he's in panic mode. Uh-oh, what, what's going on now? So when you leave there, 
you don't want to drive back in town. You got a dead body in the car with you. Take a ride on 21 and you go down and the first major intersection you come into down there is 1441. Take a left there. One of the first roads you come to down 1441, which would be out in the country back then, Blue Bonnet Circle is a old dirt road that curved back there. There wasn't very many houses back there. Whether mm -hmm. he knew that or not, I don't know. I can only imagine he was in mild panic mode or severe panic mode. What am I going to do now? What have I done? What have I done? And he pulls down the first dirt road, drags her off into the thing, heads 1441 back to 95. You take a left. It takes you right to the high school. Mm -hmm. And you park that truck at the end of Fayette Street, and you walk straight back down about a quarter mile to your house. And that's where the truck was found at the end of Fayette Street. Drawing a blank on the officer's name. Paul Alexander. Uh, Paul Alexander was diligent enough. To, he was making rounds. He said, that truck wasn't here the last time I made a round at the high school. And he ran the 28, which is the license number. It comes mm -hmm. back to Jimmy Spinell. It's not stolen. It's a little odd that it's sitting here. And it wasn't mm -hmm. here an hour ago, two hours ago. And now it is here. And that gives you the timeline. Paul Alexander might have pulled up right after Rodney got out and walked down Fayette Street. He could have just barely missed him. You never know. Yeah, Cause I agree. That does not leave you a whole lot of time. The timeline, everything. So that makes more sense than Jimmy found out. He got mad. He murdered her. He called some buddies to come over and help him out. And they went out and staged it, and they set it all up. And then they went and hid the car and did that. And then they all shut up for 20-something years. Nobody yeah. ever said nothing. Yeah. You know, a probability. They've had David Hall and they've had Curtis Davis on the stand. They never once, and Nathan Lapham, they've never once yeah. confronted any of those guys with you helped him. Yeah. So. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know Lapham a little bit. I, I have worked with him occasionally when I was in narcotics. Hall did not know him at all. Curtis Davis, I knew very well. And I'm going to tell you right now, Curtis Davis was a stand-up man. He was very ethical, very honest. And if Jimmy Fennell would have called him and said, this is what I did. Is there any way you can help me out? There is no possible way Curtis mm -hmm. Davis would have would not have said, Jimmy, I love you like a brother, but you're going to jail. Yeah. And we're going to call everybody out here and we're going to just deal with it. I don't know another side of Curtis Davis that he would not have done. That. I agree. And that's what he told the CNN producer. If Jimmy yeah, had called me and said, I accidentally killed Stacy, you got to help me cover it up. He yeah, there's said, no possible. One. Sorry, you're under arrest. I got to do it. So yeah, he would have. And I worked next to Curtis on several cases. We didn't agree on stuff. We didn't get along. We, mm -hmm. we butted heads sometimes, but it always came out. What's the right thing to do? And that's what we did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I agree. If anybody has any doubts as to what kind of man Curtis was, I'm telling you right now, he was a great dude. One thing that I think we ought to talk about is going back to the background Rodney Reed claims that because Stacy was white and he was black, they had to keep their relationship a big secret. Now, from what I understand from contemporaneous information, first of all, all of Rodney Reed's girlfriends were white girls. Ah, uh, could be. Uh, I don't know. I, I know he has kids that with a yeah. white female. I don't remember her name, but. It no, he doesn't. He, it, Rodney even says it. My kids are white. They look yeah. like you when they interviewed him in the thing. Yeah. I know he has kids and stuff. Was Rodney Reed at the risk of being lynched if he was seen no, with a white girl? Not at all. Not at all. I knew several girls in high school when I went to high school in 87, 88, 89 that had black boyfriends and vice versa. Black mm -hmm. girls had white boyfriends. And I didn't see an issue with it. When I first moved out here, I thought everybody got along great. But I mean, maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Especially in the law enforcement world, I never saw any, you know, they're like, oh, they're just out to get us black kids. That I never saw that at all. Are you familiar with Joy Montfort, who claims Ed Salmella used to harass her and David Board used to harass her and he was involved with one of Reed's cousins? I do not know that person. Okay. All right. And David and, Board and, and, you gotta, and Ed Salmella were from city police. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew David Board. He was a policeman when I was in high school here. And then fast forward later, he's the chief of police. And I've known David Board for a long time, and I've never known him to harass anybody. Now, okay. granted, you got to define harass. Are they saying he just followed me around, pulled me over all the time for no reason? Or was he doing something personally? Or 
I did not know Ed very well at all. I knew of him, but I did not know. And that's another thing, too. I guess it depends on which chair you're sitting in. Yeah. If you don't think what you're doing is wrong, even though you're driving around in a car that doesn't have a license plate or doesn't have current yeah. tags or doesn't have a brake tag or inspection sticker or you're speeding or you don't stop at a stop sign, but you don't think it's a big deal, then I guess being pulled over, you see that as harassment. Maybe so. But I mean, I know there's bad seeds everywhere, especially nowadays. It's all over the news and stuff like that. But I never knew anybody that would just go out and create work. It was so prevalent. In my patrol days, I'm like, there's no way. You don't have to pull somebody over for nothing. I guarantee you. There's plenty of people out here who are in violation of something. And you have to be very ethical and moral about what you do. What it is, is what you do when nobody's looking. If you can't do the headline test and pass it every time, then you may think about choosing a different line of work. And the headline test, and I don't know if you've heard of it, is what I'm doing right now, how is this going to look in the headlines tomorrow? Okay. And and if you can't pass that test, if you're not okay with it being in the headlines, you know, then maybe it's something you ought to rethink doing. Mm-hmm. You know, how is yeah. this going to look like in the headlines tomorrow? And for the most part, all the guys, even if I saw another officer doing something that was a little unethical or immoral, I would say something to them. You know, hey, I had an officer before in my car pull somebody over and I read his probable cause and it wasn't nothing like and I said, that is not true at all. And if you think I'm going to testify to it, you're wrong. You need to think about what you're doing here. I mean, it didn't have anything to do with this case, but it was something small. But I was like, you can't make anything up. And if people are out here thinking, these cops just make it up and pull me over for no reason. A lot of times you got to look at the totality of the circumstances, the time mm-hmm. of day, where you're at, what you're driving, how you look. Do you look like all the rest of the criminals that we have to deal with all the time? Are you in the same area? And you may or may not be doing anything, but. And that's how part you of react field sometimes can, yeah. can escalate. If, if you're cooperative and you answer questions and you do yeah. as you're asked to do, yeah. it goes very well. If you're belligerent, if you're yelling, if you're screaming, if you're cursing if you're refusing to comply then it's going to go differently yeah definitely you know? and, and it's and, not and it's and, not going to end and, well for you and the thing is is when you take things to a level of that bad things can happen whether they're right wrong or indifferent bad things can happen i'd rather comply as much as i can and if i feel he's in the wrong then there's other ways to go about it go in and make a formal complaint if somebody's actually harassing you don't just tell all your friends this guy pulled me over for no reason yeah. Well, you ain't got no license plate on your car. Right. Like you said, if I don't feel like I was doing anything wrong, they must be picking on me. But that's just law enforcement in general. Guys, you got to remember, they got enough to do as it is. <laughs> Most of the guys I know ain't got time to make stuff up and create work for themselves. Right. All right. Well, let's see. What other topics do you think we ought to cover? What's come up lately? The one thing that I do know recently, do you remember in... Was it 2019, November 20th was the last execution date. And then Dr. Phil did a big show. Was that 2019 or? I believe so. Yes. And then that's when Kim Kardashian Mm -hmm. went and had Thanksgiving with Rodney at the prison and all that kind of stuff, which good, good for them. I'm going to tell you right now, I have been interviewed by the Innocence Project and I started off the interview by telling them I agree 100% with the Innocence Project. They do great work. They they have great resources, They have, but they are 100% wasting their resources and their time and effort on mm-hmm. the Reed case, like the Morton case from Georgetown. That is exactly why the Innocence Project is around yeah. for stuff like that. That guy was innocent, and he was wrongfully convicted because of prosecutor error or misjudgment or whatever they did on purpose, not on purpose. I don't know what, what it was, but there was evidence that showed that he was innocent and it was withheld. Nobody is withholding any evidence in the Reed case. They're they're begging for credible evidence. You can't get on TV and tell a reporter, everybody knew that Rodney was dating Stacy. All these people knew it, but nobody can give any kind of credible, like every time somebody comes forward and they think it might be credible, turns out, well, you know, I really didn't see him. I just kind of heard somebody talk about it one time when I was at the party. Or mm-hmm. something like that. That's not credible. You got to have some sort of credible information that backs it up. 
the thing that gets me about these witnesses that have come forward in the last couple of years is why did you not tell police this information when Stacy was murdered in 1996? Who was the teenage girl that was on Alicia Dr. Slater? Slater. Slater. So Slater gets up there and says, I worked with Stacy at HEV. I asked her about her ring. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going you're, off you're, what I remember. You're okay, right on track. Asked, we were in the, the break room. I said, oh, what a pretty ring. Are you excited about getting married? She says, not really, because I'm dating this black guy named Rodney. No, I'm sleeping I'm like, okay. with a black guy named Rodney. Sleeping with a black guy named Rodney. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, or a month later, she's murdered. They find her body in, in the thing. And I do know that investigators, Texas Rangers, whoever, went over and interviewed everybody at HEB. And I mm -hmm. just assume, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure they interviewed her too. They did. Twice. Okay, so th they interviewed her twice. And if she would have whispered the name black guy named Rodney, she would be $50,000 richer at 16 years old mm -hmm. in 1996. They had no idea. And HEB was offering all this rewards. They were going around to shops and stores and hundred something men got tested. You know, if you were walking the parking lot at HEB, come up to you, hey, do you mind letting us swab your mouth real quick? And they were putting all that information into APHIS and nothing showed up. Yeah, yeah. If she would have said, you know, I remember talking to her, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, she said she didn't even know Stacey. I haven't read her complete interviews or complete reports regarding her interviews. But what I recall is that Alicia Slater, she was like a cart girl. She had an incident where somebody in a van apparently tried to kidnap her or grab her. Okay. So she was one of the first people they talked to thinking it might be related, that Stacy's murder uh, might be okay. related. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect sense. Alicia That's exactly Slater did go. not disclose this alleged statement by Stacy that she was sleeping with a black guy named Rodney and didn't want to get married because, you know, you've got Susan Hugan who's allegedly seen bruises and has seen Jimmy Fennell emotionally abusing Stacy or had seen Stacy's demeanor changing when Jimmy Fennell appears. No. But she doesn't say, and I saw her, I saw this, her boyfriend's abusing her, and I saw her, and she introduced this guy to me as her good friend Rodney. Hmm. You know, once again, information in 1996, she says, well, I didn't know it was important. How the heck yeah, can you not know you that that is important not yeah. only the alleged abuse and from what i remember anytime back in the day that something came out about the heb i know the prosecutor's office and the investigators were pretty thorough about looking into it like mm -hmm. somebody came in and said yeah i knew stacy she worked in customer service and she always waited on me and she was very nice and so, of course, they go in there and ask, OK, does Stacy work in customer service? And they said, no, she's never worked in customer service. She works in the produce, you know, and Stacy went in early in the morning and got off like midday. Whereas if you're 16 years old and you're doing a half a day work release at the high school, you probably don't even get to work till one, one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon or maybe even sooner. So it might have been a deal where Stacy wasn't even at HEB at the same time this girl was. But I don't know. You know, totally agree. She, they dispelled all that stuff and things. But where I was going with that, back in November of 2019, and it got real hot and heavy, and they decided to try this case in the court of public opinion. And they got a whole bunch of people on the bandwagon. The Kardashians got involved, Dr. Phil, and all the celebrities and stuff in, in Hollywood were signing up this petition that Kardashian was sending around to support their cause and Rodney and Free Rodney, because Dr. Phil, the human lie detector, says this is a travesty, and he doesn't remember that 20-something different judges have looked at this in so many different angles and so many different ways. Mm -hmm. He's just taken hearsay as fact. And when Rodney's family gets up there and says, yeah, they all knew this, and they won't even let us testify to this. And they're like, nobody credible can come forward with any information. Well, Amanda Seal, I don't know if you remember her. Yes. She impressed me very much. She signed this petition. Very well-known comedian, actress in Hollywood. She hosted the BET Awards and stuff. Super intelligent girl, super nice. She signed the petition and then got on the computer and started doing some research. Mm -hmm. 
when she figured out what she just signed up for, I think she contacted them and says, hey, take my name off that list. And any of you people who are signing this petition need to do some research and realize what you're signing, what you're doing and who you're signing this for. She gained a lot of respect from me by doing some research. And if you could just do a little bit of research and look into it. I've had numerous conversations with people in the community out here who are 110% pro Rodney. There's no way he did it. There's no way. And I'm like, all right, tell me how you came up to that conclusion. Well, you know, they were dating. I'm like, no, there's no proof at all that they were dating. There's no proof. Well, you, that's a word on the street. And I'm like, well, you can't really go by word on the street because what happened was when Rodney got arrested for killing a 19 year old, 100 pound white female, every small little white girl that was in the neighborhood out there buying drugs and stuff has now turned into Stacy Stiker. Mm hmm. There's 20 different women out there who were believed to be Stacy. Stacy was never out there. Stacy never went out and smoked crack with the cousin. And when he said Stacy was the first one to light the pipe up and stuff, I'm like, that might have been some little skinny white girl, but that wasn't Stacy. Skinny little white girls would show up to Rodney's house all the time and his aunt saw him there all the time. So those girls are all Stacy now. So right. That's why they said everybody knew he was dating Stacy. Remember that little white girl I was selling drugs to and stuff like that? That was her. Mm -hmm. So now everybody is going up on the bandwagon. I see it, you know, word on the street is not necessarily what they, what you can get on the stand and testify to, because you got to have some sort of proof. Mm -hmm. I think it was an aunt or something was at Stacy's house and she called her by a different name on the stand and said she showed up in a big red Dodge <sighs> truck. That was, yeah, that was uh, Iris if, Lindley, I believe. Yeah, she said her name so, was Stephanie. Yeah. And I have no doubt that Iris Lindley saw a small little white girl stop at Rodney's house one day asking for him in a big red truck. Mm -hmm. But that was not Stacy, because, of course, yeah. they asked that Stacy got access to a big red truck. No, who's, ain't nobody knows that. And there was a silver, a big silver truck. Speaking of trucks and cars and stuff, has Rodney ever been able to? He's like, Stacy took me up to the state park and we had consensual sex on the hood of her car. And you tell us what kind of car it was, what color it was. And anybody yeah. say what her favorite color is? Y'all were having a relationship. Can you? I've watched countless interviews with him uh, where people have gone and interviewed him. And I've been to the Wicklander, Zelensky, Reed technique of interviewing interrogation. And I mean, if you're in law enforcement, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just it's the art of interviewing somebody. Get a baseline and ask them some questions and see what they do. And then ask them some stuff that they got to think about, but they don't have any reason to lie to you. See what they do. You cannot beat it. You cannot beat it. In the class I went to, they put Bill Clinton's video up there. And when they started asking him questions and see what he did, he, you can't <laughs> hide it. When they start interviewing Rodney about, like, you're sitting on death row for 20-something years, and they come in there, they're interviewing you. I don't remember. It was a KXAN reporter, a female, went up there right after one of his stays, and, and they did a big story on him. And he's talking to her for 20-something minutes. It's mm -hmm. called Web Exclusive or something. 24, 26 minutes into it, Rodney, he sounds like he's a appeal attorney talking about writs and habeas corpus. And he's, I mean, he has educated himself on the legal terms and stuff like that. And he is answering these questions. He is going right out and she throws it right at him and says, okay, so on the night of Stacy's murder, where were you? Uh huh. And you can see his facial expression. You can see him do all kinds of stuff. He says the word work like 12 times in 20 uh -huh. seconds. I was getting ready for work. I had work. I had to go to work. I had to go. I, I uh -huh. think I was getting, I, I might've been in my mother's house. I'm like, you're sitting on death row with nothing else to do for 20 years. And you cannot still cannot answer that question. Yeah. And I don't think he was ready for it. He was not as well coached as he was when Dr. Phil went in there. He wasn't expecting her to ask that when she did ask it. I've actually sent that clip to the school, the, the read technique, and they use it as training. They're like, okay, mm -hmm. watch this guy. It's ridiculous how obvious it is. I interpreted whether he's telling the truth or not. It's just his whole demeanor changed. Yeah, he's very defensive. His forehead scrunches up. He starts stuttering. Ten seconds before that, he was talking like he was a trial lawyer. And I saw, and I may be crazy, but I saw for a split second if there had not been glass separating them, he looked <laughs> like he wanted to hit her. I don't think he was quite ready for that, that question. <laughs> that question he knew. When Dr. Phil went in there as the human lie detector, he looked him straight in the eye and says, hey, did you kill Stacy? And he was like, 
no, sir, I did not. And mm. doctor, that's all I need to hear. Now I can tell. I'm like, he knew there was a film crew in there with him. I think Roddy was wearing makeup. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, that was so set up, but I get it. It's for ratings. Dr. Phil's not going to get on there and say what's being told to him and stuff. The one thing that really bothered me about the Dr. Phil show, the Funnell lawyer, I don't remember his name, who passed away recently. Yeah. I thought he did a very good job. And, he did, uh, but it was not right. He, at one point, for a very brief time, he's in there on one side, and the three assholes are across from him on the other. Yeah, yeah. That but was not you right. Remember, and this is where I apologize, I'm, I'm jumping around, but this is where I was going with the November 20th, 2019. Up until that point, the Stikes family would not give public interviews. They would not talk to the media. They're like, if you want to know about the case, you read the files. They would not give interviews. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't do anything. After they did the stay and the Dr. Phil show came out and the Kardashians were involved, that's when the sisters and the mother said, okay, we're taking the gloves off. Who wants mm -hmm. to interview us first? They have done a fabulous job. Every time you see them interviewed, they're very credible. They're very knowledgeable. They're the ones that were at ground zero when this happened. Correct. And they knew their sister better than anybody. And if there was a chance that Stacy didn't want to get married because she was dating a black guy named Rodney, those sisters would have known. Mm -hmm. Even if she didn't say that to them, they would have known something was up. But they said she was more than ecstatic to get married and she was totally in love. She had just got her wedding dress. She was super excited. I think the mom, Carol. Yes. Stacy's mom. Bless that lady with all your heart, man, because... From what I understand, and I don't know if anybody's even researched it much, but I think I heard her say, now granted, I could be wrong, I don't know, but I think I heard her say that Jimmy normally drove Stacy to work. He would get up, drive her to work, and then he'd come home and go back to bed. They only had one vehicle. Mm -hmm. I think Carol is the one that mentioned, maybe you should just take Jimmy's truck in the morning and I'll bring him in later when you get off. I got to go to town anyway. And I think they were going to do something for their wedding. Yes. If it had not been for Carol probably saying that, Jimmy probably would have got up and drove her to work that morning. Whether she realizes that or not, that would be a big deal. Like, man, if I would have never said that, she'd still be here. I she think wouldn't have she run does. Into yeah, by herself. Yeah. And from what I recall, though, from reading Carol's statements is it actually was she and Stacy both thought that was the more practical avenue to take. And it does. It does make sense if she's coming into Bastrop the next day anyway. There's no mm -hmm. sense in getting up at three o'clock in the morning, driving 30 something minutes to yeah. ATV and, and then driving home and then having to go right back. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about on a lot of the claims with the witnesses that claim there was strife in the relationship between Stacy and Jimmy Fennell. A lot of them say, well, she used to hide when he came to the store. Now, Jimmy was in Giddings. He worked as a police mm -hmm. officer in Giddings. Stacy worked at the HEB in Bastrop. How likely is it for Jimmy Fennell to have been able to pop in to the Bastrop yeah. HEB to see Stacy? Yeah, he would have had to make a concerted effort to drive. That's an hour there and back. Yeah. Hour and 20 minutes or something like that. Unless he was in Bastrop doing some sort of business or something and he's like, ah, Stacy's over there. And, you know, it's young love and stuff like that. But Stacy didn't really have a job where she could receive visitors. I wouldn't think that he's able to go, uh, well, she might be on break. I'll go hang out with her for 10 minutes or so. Granted, they're young and in love and getting married and stuff like that. Can't be without each other. But if they're like that, I doubt very seriously she was hiding from him or anything like that. Right. Exactly. Of course, none of those claims are corroborated. It's all, this must be how it is. This must be, I've heard so many, you know, she was dating him and she was scared of Jimmy. I didn't know her, but she, from what I have heard, she didn't seem like she was a weak person. Uh -uh. Like she would put up with that for very long at all. No. Carol and, and the sisters that I know and have met now, I was like, I don't think anybody, anybody in that family would have put up with an abusive relationship. And they surely would not have been supportive in her marriage to him. Crystal and Deborah have both said unequivocally that Stacy would not have tolerated. That would have been the first time yeah. Jimmy physically, emotionally. Yeah. She would have been out. She would have been gone. She would not have tolerated that. And Curtis Davis said that from his observations, it looked more like Stacy was the boss in that relationship. 
because he said Could at one be. point, Stacy said jump, and Jimmy said how high. Well, I mean, you know, they're young, and I've been married 23 years, and I still say how high. Mm-hmm. And Stacy was a very outgoing, I want to say gregarious person. So, and yeah. Fennell yeah. was very quiet to himself, and you know, she really didn't seem in like a shell. A, a vi- she didn't seem like a victim at all. Like no. Anybody who would play the victim and, and not, hide it. No. Again, her sisters have unequivocally said no. That was not Stacy. And again, all these people, why didn't they say anything in 1996? Yeah. They try to claim, why well, didn't know it was important? How in the hell can you not know that's important? Yeah. And, you know, even the cops that have come forward, when they say a former Bastrop County deputy sheriff said that he has information on Jimmy Fennell. Granted, the person that they were talking about at the time, I'm like, I'm not even sure if that guy knew Jimmy Fennell. He was a reserve volunteer jailer. Wayne Fletcher? For, no, no. Okay. This is one that came out later, Durless. Okay, Durless. All right. And I have talked to people that were jailers or worked in the jail, and they are adamant that jimmy Fennell did it they're like oh, yeah i do have done it they were dating and i was like you guys were in that jail and y'all seen it most of the people have now changed their mind and once you pose the the actual evidence nothing against any of these people that are coming forward but you know this is probably the largest case that's ever come out of bastrop and there's a lot of people that have been able to jump on the bandwagon get their 15 minutes and not saying that they don't believe that they might have seen or heard something or back in the day when I was in there and they come in and Jimmy might have brought somebody in and was rude to him. And like the one I sat in a, a hearing when, oh, what was that guy's name from Giddings King? He was a lawyer. Yes. Something Steve King. King. Stephen King. Yeah. He came in there and he said, a client of mine came to me and said she saw Jimmy Fennell the night she was murdered in a truck. And Jimmy grabbed Stacy. It was Jimmy and Stacy. And he rammed her face. And and I was like, man, how is this possible? Because, of course, they stopped everything. They had a trial. They brought Reed in. And this guy said, I told the prosecutor this information. And he just told me that ain't going to have nothing to do with it. Because the prosecution knew that this was just another person coming in. And there's no doubt she might have seen two people in a vehicle at the old Frontier store mm-hmm. in Page on 290, which is about halfway between Giddings and Bastrop. She said she stopped there on the way to work to get a soda out of the machine. The store was not open, and she saw mm-hmm. a car there, and she saw Jimmy and Stacy in there, and they were fighting, and he slammed her face into the thing. It's very possible. She could have seen somebody in a car fighting, and the guy was slapping a girl. But what she saw was not Jimmy, because mm-hmm. I think the 28 had already been run by this time on the car by Paul Alexander. Mm-hmm. The timeline. Yeah. It was like she said, I drive in at this time. I stop at the store at this time. And the time she gave was about 15 minutes before Alexander ran the 28 on the car. So there's no possible way that he could have killed her, threw her in the thing and then drove and dumped the car. And the time was just right. not there. But when the prosecutor stood up and said, well, let me ask you this. How do you know Jimmy Fennell? And she said, I've seen his face in the paper. Yeah. And they rolled in every newspaper for the last two years. <laughs> yeah. The judge like, let me guess. There's no pictures of Jimmy Fennell in any of them papers. They said not mm-hmm. one, any of them. And then she said, I'll even go as far as this. Let me tell you how she knows Jimmy Fennell. A year or two before that, right after Stacy's thing, somewhere around that timeline. Jimmy arrested her for DWI Mm -hmm. in Giddings and there's a probable cause warrant with her name on it. And he's like, that's how, you know, Jimmy, and you're kind of mad at him. So you're like, ah, I'm going to, and it's just little stuff like that, that Mm -hmm. people come forward and they're proven to be wrong and vindictive over. I'll show him, watch this. I was embarrassed for that girl to come forward like that. And Stephen King to, to sit there and listen to it. And he had been involved with a civil suit against Fennell and the Giddings police. Who, Stephen King? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not know him. I just knew he was just saying she was a former client of his. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know him at all. Yeah. And now we're to the point where I'm almost interested to see the next person that's going to come out of the woodworks. Because if there is some movement in the near future mm-hmm. and if they set another date, 
and people are just going to lose their minds over this. I'm sure the Reed family GoFundMe page is just going to blow up again. Roderick and his mother are going to go on tour. You know, they have met Oprah and Dr. Phil and the Kardashians. They've been to New York. They've been to California. They've been traveling all over because of something Rodney did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they are on celebrity status. I assume they're pulling a salary out of this, the donations that's made and stuff like that. And somebody's paying for them to fly out to California, mm -hmm. get on that Dr. Phil show and stuff. So it sounds like a pretty lucrative deal for them. And I get it. What I really hope is if for some reason, which I'm not very optimistic on it, that the death penalty does go forward, tell your mom. I really hope and pray. Don't tell the public if you don't want to, but tell your mom, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. come clean with your mom so she doesn't have to live the rest of her life thinking that, you know, because she's been telling herself this for so long. She probably honestly believes that Rodney is innocent I... and, and there's no way he did it. And, you know. And I, I feel for her, but the evidence is so overwhelming. There's no chance. Rodney has a better chance of winning the, the lottery twice in a row yeah. than being innocent of this, this crime. I disagree with you. I think Mrs. Reed knows very well exactly what Rodney did. She and her family have always played the victim. Yeah. And, and she and let Rodney play the victim. Because he didn't want to do the work. He quit school because everybody was always out to get him. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, and, I think she knows very well what he did. So I don't think he has anything to confess to her. And, and I agree with you there. I'm just saying she has told this story for so long now, she might even start believing it. You know? I'm more but cynical. deep down inside. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm trying to be, you know. About I, I'm, I trying, can't... I'm trying to have a little more remorse for her because she's a mother. And it's her child. And I get it, but your child is a demon, and he's where he needs to be. But she and Roderick are tarnishing Stacy's reputation. And now let's flip back to the other side of it. Yes, you're very and right. They're, they're tarnishing you know, Stacy, they're, and they're making Stacy look like someone she wasn't. Yeah, it's people very like hard on Stacy's family. Yes, Josie and all these other people talking about how Stacy had biracial children with multiple men. Multiple children, even though that's a total lie, they're propagating lies about Stacy. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I was just talking about the mother son version of it, but then you get into it. Yeah, you're right. The y'all are, are living off of the the demon. The it's demon did the not demon fall side. far from that dragon egg. <laughs> you have a very bad point. <laughs> you know, I'm very cynical about mom. Again, I think she's always known, but yeah. she wants to play she, the victim and play she, him as the victim. Yeah. She probably and, knew when he came home that night. Where you been? What, Mom? What are you talking about? Uh-huh. Let's go back to Dr. Phil one more time. And when I said where Dr. Phil lost me is when he said, now Rodney is no choir boy. And the only thing I could think of, and I don't know the, the girl's name or nothing, but the 12-year-old at the time. I mean, I don't have it in front of me. But the only thing I could think of is no choir boy. Let me send you a picture and you tell me about your choir boy. Same with Kardashian and all that. The only thing they could say of, well, he was never convicted of raping a 12 year old. When we say raping a 12 year old, I don't mean my uncle touched me inappropriately. I knew him. He was a family friend. He, this is a predator that was outside of a, a house who saw her through a window and broke in like he's the BTK killer and went in and found the 12 year old on the couch and sodomized and raped her, mm -hmm. brutally raped her and beat her and then left and yeah. left everything innocent about her behind. Mm -hmm. And then when you say no choir boy, he's no choir boy. Well, let me tell you something about your choir boy. That's aside from Stacy Stike. Thank God for Aethis. And see just mm -hmm. and all the things that we use now because a lot of people don't realize that Stacy was found murdered. They collected evidence from her. They know she's got semen and saliva and stuff all over her, fresh, recently deposited. It's a crime scene. And the Podunk, Bastrop County, and Bastrop PD did not go out there and work that scene. That was the Texas Department of Public Safety mm -hmm. crime scene analyst. These people have tons of education, tons of training. That's what they do. That's what they do. And they say, well, this is just a small town, blah, 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 whatever. They go out there and they process the scene and they do a thorough job. 
And then they put this evidence into the computer, just say the computer, but they don't have anybody to compare it to. So they go <laughs> around and they start comparing to it. along with a bunch of other, we had several unsolved rapes in the area. I say several, a few, a year later, Linda Sluter gets abducted, whatever, and survives it and gives them the name Rodney Reed. And then Rocky Wardlow says, would David board it? They're like, hey, that sounds like it could be similar to the Stites case. They get Reed's DNA and they didn't have to go to Reed to get it because a short time before that, apparently the mother who has some mental issues and stuff was at her house. Rodney comes, kicks in the door, and he beats her up and rapes her. And they call the police, and they did a rape kit on her. They got underwear. They got all this stuff, and they had that in evidence. That was actually got... Caroline, and she was a girlfriend yeah. who was yeah, mentally Caroline. challenged. Yeah. So Caroline calls the police because she gets beat up, and she's, no, I mean. What actually happened was, want to keep the facts clear and straight. Caroline was a mentally challenged girlfriend. When she didn't want to have sex with Rodney Reed, he would beat her and rape her. Yes. Her, like a social worker, she was getting help from like a social worker to take care of her rent and pay her bills and things like that because she was yes. an adult. And the social worker noticed her sitting funny. Yeah. And asked her what so happened. She didn't call the sheriff. No. Office. The social worker. She gave, she in. told the social worker what was happening. The social worker called the police. Okay, so maybe I'm wrong with how they got this evidence, mm -hmm. but I thought it was from Caroline where they went yeah. out and they did a, a crime scene. They took evidence out of her house. Correct. And they did a case, like a rape case, and they did yeah. a rape kit on her and they did all this kind of stuff. And then they take that as evidence from the defense side. They've said, well, David Board just saved this stuff in his locker to, to have it on hand. And that's not what happens at all. Mm -hmm. If you go out and you take a felony rape case by law, they have to hold that for 10 years. Yeah. You cannot destroy the evidence. Even if she comes in and gives an affidavit and non-prosecution, I'm not going forward mm -hmm. with this. And they dismiss the case. By law, you have to keep it for 10 years. Yeah. You can't just say, ah, oh, well, she doesn't want to pursue it. We're going to throw it in the dumpster. Yeah. You can't do that. So no. they have that on hand. So they take that stuff and they send it to the lab when they suspect him of the Linda Sluter case. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, let's get Reed's DNA into the, to APHIS. Apis or Sejus, whichever one does the DNA. So they have that evidence, and it may or may not even been at the crime lab. I don't know. But they test that and get his DNA off of it. They put it into the computer, and up pops like three or four unsolved rapes where we have DNA, but we don't have nobody to compare it to. One of them is the 12-year-old. One of them is the lady under the bridge. Uh, I don't remember her name either. Vivian and Angela. Yeah. Yeah, and Stacy. And they're, they're unsolved. DNA cases. We don't know who the guy is, but we got his DNA. Now they're solved. We know who it was. Yeah. They scoop all this up and then they file the case on him. So you got to go off the probability. Now he's a known rapist because we got at least three, if not four, active rapes in the last mm -hmm. few years where he is the donor of the sperm that they found on the victims. Mm -hmm. And one of them is dead. Yeah. So they file the highest case, they take it in there, and they talk about all that in the punishment phase. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't talk about the 12-year-old in the trial, but once he's found guilty, you can bring all that up in the punishment phase, and you roll it all into one. And when Dr. Phil says, well, he's never been convicted of that. Well, you know, he's been convicted of the ultimate case, and they've used all of these to help send him to the death penalty. Correct. But on TV, they downplay so much. He is no choir boy. And that's one of the things that's so hypocritical because they're using imagined crimes allegedly committed by Jimmy Finnell to say yeah. he killed Stacy. And yet we've got these known rape cases where three of them link Rodney Reed by DNA yeah. and they so, don't count because he was never tried and convicted in court. And we got to remember you now. I did not know Jimmy. I don't know Jimmy. Jimmy was a cop. He probably should have kind of got out of the field after the whole Stacy Stikes case, but he apparently thought he could handle it. He could do things. Now, I don't know the specifics of the Georgetown thing. I have my own opinion on it, but he got what he deserved. 
you know, mm -hmm. official oppression. I mean, that happens all the time. Can't tell you how many times it was offered up to me. I kept my ethics and my morals intact, but it happens yeah. all the time. I'm not defending him at all. He served his time. He did it, but that was 10 years after Stacy. Now, granted, one of my favorite prosecutors that I worked with at the Bastrop County DA's office was no longer there. She said at one time, she goes, if we are going to judge Jimmy Fennell on his actions post Stacy murder, then we should be able to judge Rodney on his actions pre Stacy murder. They're like, okay, we can talk about what Jimmy did 10 years later, but let's not talk about Rodney did around the time that Stacy was murdered. Correct. And I don't know, maybe we've talked about this before, but some of those cases kind of mirror each other. Like the, the one in Wichita Falls, is that mm -hmm. where it was? Yeah. And the 12-year-old were almost identical. Yeah. Where he broke through the back door, he saw her and went in there. And I don't know what happened up in Wichita Falls, but I think Connie got a raw deal in that case. Yeah. Up there and, Connie was a I classmate. Read. They went to school so he, together. So he knew her. He knew her. He knew her. She knew her. Um, and then all of a sudden. And of course, again, this is his MO. He rapes Connie when he's arrested. They want to do a blood test. He says he had a secret affair with her. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't but, that so, story sound familiar? And remind me, because I don't have that in front of me, but did she not say he broke in through her back door or something? I think it was a window, a window in the oh, house. In a, in a, yeah, which and is very similar to the way he got into the 12 year old's house. That he was at Angela's earlier in the evening. The 12 with, year old. Yeah. With so his he, cousin so he Ron knew her. Moore. Huh? There was a broken window in that apartment that he could have used to gain entry, but he also could have left a door unlocked. And. For anybody who is questioning, and the reason I say this is the 12-year-old, is her name Angela? Angela, yeah. Okay, so Angela, when I was doing the interview with the Innocence Project here, and I asked him, what do you think about the 12-year-old? And I showed him the picture of the 12-year-old's face with the bite marks on it. Mm -hmm. I said, this is the guy you're representing as the innocence project and y'all are spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of resources on mm -hmm. this read case but this is who you're defending and i i get it it's totally separate and he asked me have you ever heard of slaughter james slaughter <laughs> and, I, and i knew exactly what he was talking about i'm like i do know james slaughter i went to high school with james Slaughter mm -hmm. and ronnie moore and all of them i know all of these guys and mm -hmm. James Slaughter, at the same time Rodney was doing his deeds out here, Slaughter was doing the same thing. He was beating right. girls up and raping them. They'd come out into the hood out there and buying dope. If they didn't tell him yeah. what he wanted to hear, he'd slap them around and take what he wanted to. And he got yeah. life in prison for it. Yeah, He is life in prison. So at the time, they thought it was James Slaughter who raped Angela. So they go and talk to Angela and they say, hey, do you know James Slaughter? Yeah, I know James Slaughter. Could it have been him? And she says, well, yeah, it could have been him because mm -hmm. she did not know who raped her. And so they got an affidavit from her that says, I think it might have been James Slaughter. That gave them the probable cause to go get James Slaughter's DNA mm -hmm. and test it. And they go get James Slaughter's DNA and it ain't his DNA. It's right. not James Slaughter. I mean, it's just not James Slaughter. And they thought they had a clear cut case. We got James Slaughter because they did not know about Rodney at the time. What he was doing, playing that to the Innocence Project investigator, too. And he was like, well, I didn't know that part. And I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure he knew that part. But if you don't know that part, then you should probably educate yourself on the research that y'all do right. have. James Slaughter was excluded first by serology in 1987 and then by DNA in 1997 or 1998 ahead of the trial yeah so whether angela believed it might have been james slaughter doesn't matter the dna says it was not james yeah. slaughter it could not have been james slaughter but it was rodney reed yeah that's the part that offends me with the innocence project the most is they are trying to say that the dna evidence recovered from stacy 
and recovered in these other two rape cases that identify Rodney Reed is insignificant, is unrelated to Stacy's murder, and is not worthy well, of consideration. And that well, if you is take... the worst, most hypocritical, fraudulent part of this whole thing. Yeah. Is that the DNA is meaningless. Well, and you got to remember, that's the only thing they can. How else do you explain your DNA inside of a dead woman's body? Mm -hmm. Oh, we were having an affair. Of course we were. There's no other way to explain it. At one point, they, they tried to say that David Board had a syringe full of Rodney's DNA and they planted it on her. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, I'm like, oh, my God, you know how ridiculous that sounds. David Fisher but, is still trying to sell that dog and pony show. He still wants people to believe there is no DNA at all. And if there is DNA, David Board planted it all. Well, D David is a, a brilliant person. I mean, I, I never had any problems with David. I thought he was an excellent cop. I knew him a long time ago. I knew him as the chief. And David Board, there's no possible way he would have done something like that. He is a smart guy. He's probably the smartest out of all the people involved in this. And he could not have pulled that off. There's no way. Physically, he could not have pulled that off because there was live semen inside of her. Yeah. So in their thing, oh, yeah, semen can live for a long time. Okay, so he got a sample of Rodney's live semen mm -hmm. within, they say, 48, 72 hours. And then mm -hmm. that's just not possible. Yeah. There's there's no scenario, even on TV and CSI, you could do that. Yeah. I do not. I know of David Fisher, and I know I've heard, you know, grumblings, and I do not know him personally. I know he's a conspiracy theorist, and he'd really like for some of his conspiracies to be true. And you might even honestly believe him and stuff like that. But when you find people like that and you just show them the actual scientific evidence and they go, well, that can't be true. I'm like, it's true in a gazillion other cases. Just for example, the DNA is what exonerated Michael Morton. Mm -hmm. They went totally 100% off DNA and the fact that it was evidence that was suppressed by the prosecution. Mm -hmm. And that, as Dr. Wick says, is a travesty of justice. That is yeah. exactly what that is. It cost that man everything. And I feel for him long and hard. I would hate to be the person who did that to him yeah there's no possible way i could even sleep at night if i knew that there was an innocent man in, in prison based like the little bit of research i've done what happened actually was at the time the da suppressed evidence that he believed was equivocal that would not help the defense and so the defense never had an opportunity to try and use it. Yeah. But he didn't. Me as an investigator, a bandana that's got blood on it that's found within close proximity of right. a murder scene right. is more than significant. Right. I remember the Boutwell days. He was the law enforcement guru and everybody put him on a pedestal and he was like, I'm a special ranger and I'm this. And remember the whole days of Henry Lee Lucas, he took him on tour. He even brought him out to a couple of crime scenes out here. Yeah, I think I killed these people. Sure. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and they were like, he was in prison in Florida when these people were killed. You know, Yeah. <laughs> that turned out to be just a crazy, insane yeah. thing. But I read the report and the story of when Morton came home and Boutwell was sitting in his living room and said, why'd you do it type thing? And he's like, I didn't do it. Yeah, you did. What, what makes you think I did it? Well, I'm the sheriff. And then what I say goes type thing, you know, mm -hmm. and that was the atmosphere back there. Well. He's a special investigator and he's a special prosecutor. He he must be right. You know, they put a lot of emphasis on that kind of thing back in those days and came back to haunt them. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it, it was it was equivocal at the time, but he still should have been able to point to it and say, but hey, you know, this bandana was found here and the blood could belong to the victim. And I didn't leave it there. You know, I, I don't have yeah. anything to do with it. I, I think, you know, thinking back on, you know, just a report I read, I think wasn't it like a family member of Morton that found it and pointed it out and they collected it. And then years later, he asked, hey, why didn't they ever say nothing about that bandana or something like that? Yeah. And then when they like did. Said, again, I haven't read the case law in a while, but the 1988 
testing, the results were equivocal. I think it was the same blood type. Yeah. But there was no genotyping. There was no DNA. Yeah. That was so later. I mean, it didn't thank God exclude the technology her, but it didn't. Through. It what they did they couldn't say it was her blood. Yeah. It it just didn't. But then, it, yeah. but then later they tested it again. They did, did DNA the, testing on it post conviction, yeah. and that was her blood. Yeah. And I believe and, that there know, was was additional DNA that linked it to the guy in the van. Yeah. His sweat yeah. on the bandana. Yeah. Her blood on the bandana. And, you know, side note, which is so crazy, you know, when they did do that testing and stuff like that, I was assigned to the U.S. Marshals Task Force at the time. And the Marshals called and had us go put eyes on the dishwasher at Maxine's restaurant downtown Bastrop because it was his DNA on the, the bandana. OK, and he he was found. We arrested him in Bastrop that evening. And the thing that really I forget his name. And I felt so bad because his mother was so super sweet, this elderly lady that very church going. And, and he was living with her at her house down the road from the restaurant. And he was washing dishes in there. Nobody knew him. You know, he's just this big, tall, creepy guy with a, like a Fu Manchu beard. When I saw him and he had this big, long beard, the first thing that I remembered is when they interviewed the Morton child, who was three four or five years old, something like that. He's very young, you know, when she was murdered. He said in his interview that a monster killed his mom, not his dad. I was like, that guy, I can see that guy looking like a monster to that kid. You know, now granted, it's 20 something years later, 25 something years later, but it, isn't it ironic that that guy was found downtown Bastrop when the DNA came back and they let Morton out and they said, well, it belongs to that guy. Go get eyes on him. We're working on a warrant for his arrest. Mark Norwood. Norwood. That's it. Norwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mark Allen Norwood. Yeah. And then I think they tied him to several other or a couple other incidents in the Austin I, area. Laying carpet was, down the street or something like that. Yeah. I, th I think he was tied to one other murder by DNA. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I'm probably not going to be very popular with this, but I don't believe that at the time of Morton's trial, I don't believe that the DAs had anything that would make them doubt that they were right. Now, maybe that's well, because they weren't looking be. hard enough. And they, and they may have made the mistake of thinking that that bandana was just so in insignificant Correct. at the time. Because you got to think about the they, time. They did. They believed it was insignificant. They believed that the results were equivocal. Yeah. While they should have I wholeheartedly believe they should have at least given the information to Morton's defense. Yep. Sure should have. To see, because it might have changed the outcome of his trial. Yeah. But they made the decision that it was insignificant and that it wouldn't have changed the outcome. And so they didn't have to give it to him. It I wasn't enough like compared left, but... with all the evidence they had. And I mean... Yeah. When you look at the yeah, Rodney I mean, Reed case, we, the reason he's not able to get additional DNA testing done on the belt is because he's yeah. already linked to the crime by DNA. That's why yeah. and, he can't get two, DNA. Let me let me talk about the belt real quick. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I know people say it's the belt. It's the belt. It's what killed her. It's it's the the crime. The murder it's weapon. The, mur the, murder, the weapon. murder weapon. It's the murder weapon. It would be tested like, today. Yeah, it, it would be tested today. And. If that was the case, if we had this murder today, that's exactly what they would do. They would test that belt, you know, preserve it in a totally different way than they did back then. But whenever they say, why don't they just test the belt? Why don't they just test it? Well, what that will do, in, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, OK, let's thin the belt up and let's test it. Well, then that buys Rodney another two to three years because they're going to appeal the results. And first of all, you got to show. That by testing the belt, you can change the outcome of this case. If yeah. Rodney's DNA is not on that belt, that doesn't exonerate him. If Jimmy Fennell's DNA is on that belt, that doesn't exonerate Rodney. If Rodney's DNA is on the belt, it doesn't change the outcome of the case. If Jimmy's DNA is not on the belt and they want to do touch, 
DNA testing on it to see who touched it. Mm -hmm. And just like they said, they passed the belt around in the courtroom back in 1998, which they say, oh, my God, I can't believe they did that. Well, they didn't have any idea that 20 years from now we're going to be able to touch DNA. Yeah. And we could take a swab over your fingerprint and get DNA off of it. We had no idea. I mean, we didn't know we were going to be all driving electric cars and stuff back then either. You know, it's technology that's come a long way. And thank God. Now, it would be Mm -hmm. a. We wouldn't even be talking about this case if it happened these days. Yeah. I mean, it would be so open and shut, and you'd probably have a ton of video of everything that you need. And that's what it's gotten to today. You have to pretty much bring it in on video to to prosecute somebody. But everybody who asked me, well, why won't they just test it? Well, the only reason that the Innocence Project knows that it's going to make no difference. Mm -hmm. No matter what you find on that belt, it makes no difference. If Rodney's DNA is not on it, that does not change mm-hmm. the outcome of this case. It's very insignificant. If his DNA is on it, it doesn't change the outcome. But what it does do is it buys them another two, three years of appeals. And it Correct. buys Rodney more time on earth. You know, And that's all they're looking for when they were posting it out. Anybody who has any information, if you got any dirt on any of these officers, anybody, they were looking for something that they can come forward with. Whether it was true or not, mm-hmm. they'll throw it out there, and that just buys you more time. Buys right. you more time, and, and maybe Rodney will never get off death row. He'll never get out of prison, and maybe they can prolong his life so he can die of natural causes in there. Correct. And and they're spending millions of dollars in resources and assets to, to prolong his life on death row. And Correct. that's just what they do. And that's what I was explaining to the investigator out here i'm like you guys y'all have a good platform but make sure you're doing good work for the people who deserve it and need it and stuff like that you're wasting a lot of time he agreed with me 100 percent, but he's still one of those now if they would have gave rodney reed life without parole back then which was not available a lot of people say why don't they just give him life without parole well that's pretty much what he got right now because they can't yeah. go forward and, with, with all these appeals yeah if they change it to life, which was on the table back then, now he will probably parole out because he's yeah. been in jail long enough. He'll be out on the streets. They said, why don't they just give him life without parole? Because it was not available back then. He would probably have to serve 38 to 40. We, but in 1998, it was 30. Eight. 30. Yeah, 38 yeah, to 40. But- so he would be eligible for parole. Wouldn't necessarily get parole. Yeah. But Wouldn't he would be eligible it, at 38 years. So we don't have any kind of answer from the latest appeal to the Supreme Court? No. That all. decision, we're waiting for an opinion to be Sent back down. issued. Yeah. I imagine the nine are trying to figure out where they fall. Yeah. I'm sure Justice Thomas is crafting a either a great majority opinion or a great dissent. But what is going to be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court is not whether or not Roddy Reed can even get DNA testing. The only thing the Supreme Court is going to decide is whether he has a chance to go back into federal court to try to challenge the court, the Texas state court interpretations of Texas state DNA law. And it's entirely possible that he gets back to federal court to pursue that because they say he filed on time. And then the judge dismisses it because, in reality, the federal court can't tell the state court to give Rodney Reed DNA testing. Yeah. And he's not challenging the constitutionality of the DNA statute. He's challenging the interpretation by the state courts. Yeah. Us as the state. Yeah. yeah. Our interpretation is it's his DNA based on scientific it, testing. Testing the belt, that's where his DNA that's all question, over Stacy's body also comes in, is that provides overwhelming evidence of Rodney Reed's guilt. You can have as many people as you want come out of the woodwork and claim there was a relationship, but they haven't been found to be reliable or credible. So yeah. the relationship remains unproven, uncorroborated. Yep. And that means 
the DNA is significant as DNA from the person who raped and strangled and murdered Stacy. The thing is, is I truly believe that there's some people that think they saw him with her, but mm -hmm. what they actually saw was him with a girl who looks like Stacy. There's probably several people when he said, hey, everybody out here knows that he was dating Stacy. Uh -huh. Well, can you describe her? She's a short, little, skinny white girl with dark hair. Like that's half of Bastrop County. <laughs> and Stacy was tall. Yeah. Stacy, I think, was I mean, five, to, six. To, yeah, but to, to Roderick, that's that's short. You know, he's six, four, six, five. There's no doubt that they go, oh, yeah, I used to see him with her all the time. She'd pick him up and drive him around, bring him over to my house and stuff. Uh -huh. Well, I have no doubt that they're telling what they think they saw. And they probably did see a skinny white girl driving around, giving Rodney yeah. a ride. Yeah. It's very possible. But the skinny white girl was not Stacy Stike. There's no telling who it was, but it was not Stacy. Yeah. There's no evidence to prove otherwise because when you say okay so how do you know it was stacy well i don't really know i just know yeah i've seen her right and nobody can come forward with credible evidence here's a note stacy wrote me and handwriting experts can see it and say it was mm -hmm. written by her and she talks about i met this guy named rodney and you know i really don't want to get married or whatever mm -hmm. right it's just short of that you're not going to come forward and say, yeah, I knew it was happening. At this point, the biggest question is, why'd you wait so long? You had to have known that this was significant. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and, definitely. Those but, people who testified at the hearing said, oh, I didn't know it was important. They're lying through yeah. their teeth. How, how can, can you not can think you say it's that's important, not important when your co-worker's murdered? If I was Rodney, I would be screaming at the top of my lungs. What do you mean it's not important? Here uh -huh. I am on death row for blah, blah, blah. And you had, if it was actually true. Yeah. Rodney knows there's nobody going to come forward. And I mean, he's played all his cards. Kudos to the Innocence Project. They've done a fabulous job of hewing this in the public image. Because mm -hmm. you, you can get on TV and say whatever you want to say, but you can't get on the stand and say something that's not true. Yeah. And, and that's why Rodney's times never out testified. Of 10, nine times out of 10. You can't get up there. Everybody who does come forward, you can get on Dr. Phil. Mm -hmm. He can fly you out to California, put you up in the nicest hotel, send you out dinner on the town and stuff and have drinks. So get on there and say whatever you want. It's not illegal. Yeah. It's not illegal. But when you come to court and you raise your right hand and swear an oath, you better not lie. Because if mm -hmm. they prove you're lying, it, it gets ugly. Yeah. And And that's what that's why nobody comes to court and testifies to this. All the people that they're talking about when Dr. Phil goes, hell yeah, I think it's wrong. And they should have heard all this in court and stuff like that. I'd say, all right, let's go swear this girl in right now and have her testify in front of a jury mm -hmm. and see if she actually says what she just said on your TV show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guarantee you her story will be considerably different. Like, well, you know, I, I, I don't really remember, but I kind of had a thought where maybe that really didn't happen. But for some reason, I, I just I vaguely remember this incident. And, and then when you show her, you're like, well, uh, how could it have happened? Because you didn't work with Stacy at the same time. Mm -hmm. Stacy got off an hour before you even went in. Yeah. You know, and then you're like, just like all the ants and stuff that have come forward. Yeah. How do you know it was Stacy? Well, I know Stacy once she worked at the HEV. She worked in the service desk and she used mm -hmm. to wait on me and she was very nice. Well, how could it have been Stacy when Stacy's never worked the service desk? Maybe it wasn't Stacy. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, that was a whole lot to go on. Meller Marie Aldrich, who said yeah. Stacy waited on her in customer service yeah. and had a best friend named Rose who lived at the projects, a yeah. Spanish girl. And well, there was no Spanish girl named Rose working at HEB, nor did Stacy work in the customer service department. Yeah. And so. she may have been remembering another girl that she talked to at HEB. Mm -hmm. And she, I'm not saying she just got up there and flat out lied, just saying she, in her mind, oh, yeah, I remember that girl I used to talk to. And I remember that girl. She used to talk about some girl named whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I will say this about the whole case everybody involved on the prosecution side, 
Lisa Tanner and her team and Brian Gertz and his team and everybody who's involved from the Texas Rangers and stuff did a a number one class act job. You know, there's some little stuff, little stuff like, do we wish we would have searched Jimmy Finnell's apartment at the time? Sure we do because we wouldn't be talking about it now, but at the time they didn't have any reason to search us. He was, you know, a grieving fiance Mm -hmm. and, they were in his apartment, you know, those guys, you know, Curtis and all them went to his apartment to talk to him, you know, and console him and be a friend. And if they would have seen anything out of the ordinary, you know, like right. signs of a struggle or anything out of, out of place or whatever, they would have brought it up mm-hmm. and it probably would have piqued their interest. And I, I'll go as far as to say, I'm not sure if they didn't go over there as friends and look around and, Say, well, maybe it was, I don't know, maybe it was Jimmy. You think he could have done this, you know? You know, every scenario is possible. The fact that they didn't search his house immediately is almost, that's a no-brainer to me. Me as the investigator, I don't think that would have been high on my priority list. The apartment was in Lee County, so they would have had to go to Lee County and get a Lee County judge to give him a warrant. And they had no probable cause because last place she was seen... And he's the prime suspect are neither, neither count as probable cause under the Fourth Amendment. You know, the search and seizure Fourth Amendment, that's kind of my, my wheelhouse and stuff like that. They would have had probable cause to go back there. I guarantee if they would have said, hey, Jimmy, do you mind if we come search your house? He probably would have said, sure, come on in. At that point, knowing what we know now, he didn't have anything to hide mm-hmm. for sure. The statement from Carol, this is mom, yeah. said that when the manager called, she called upstairs to Jimmy, obviously woke him up from a deep sleep. He runs down, gets in her car, and takes off to go look for Stacy because she didn't make it to work. Yeah. Everything is fitting. You know, if he just went and dumped her body and hit the car and got a ride back and came back. I mean, uh, and apparently Carol is the one that says she heard one person walk down the, she heard Stacy is what she said. And they said, well, how do you know it was Stacy? Well, I didn't see her, but when you're in the house and you got three kids and a husband and your, your five-year-old walks down the hall, you know, who's coming. You don't mm-hmm. see her. But when your husband yeah. walks down the hall, you know, it's him. I mean, you can yeah. tell, you know, she's probably heard Jimmy, clog up and down them stairs a hundred times and she's probably heard Stacy clog up and down them two stairs and she can tell the difference when right when it's Stacy or when it's Jimmy. So and, in her mind she's like, well I heard Stacy leave. I heard one person get in the truck and drive off, you know. And Jimmy would have had to make multiple trips. Yeah. Jimmy would have taken two or three it would have had to have two or three trips getting the body yeah, in the truck. There's also the theory, well the body was in the truck for several hours before Okay, well, that means he put it in the truck and left it in the parking lot and then went back up to the apartment. I can tell you the whole reason they're trying to move the time of death back is that they think it gives Fennell more time to get from Bastrop back to Giddings. Well, that doesn't do him any good because Carol is the last person other than Jimmy to see her a lot. That's her daughter. She knows what she looks like. I guarantee you that image is burnt in that sweet lady's head for the rest of her life. Yeah. That was the last time she, that is burnt into her memory. She's never going to forget that. They have to move it back to a time when we know Stacy was alive and well. Then you get into the the discussion that I was talking about earlier. She was alive and well at nine o'clock. Okay. If he killed her at 10, that means they had to have dressed her in her HEB uniform. And take her and put her out there. Yeah. And we go back to the investigator. You said his name. He came up with a theory. She was drowned because the autopsy says she has fluid uh, in her lungs. Fluid in her lungs. I don't know how much time we got, but I'll give you my theory on that. (laughs) I've been to a bunch of autopsies. I've been to my share of murder scenes and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. Stacy had a big tumbler full of water. In her center Mm -hmm. console. And I think it was busted up and cracked. And there was still water and ice in the bottom of it, from what I believe, in the crime scene photos and stuff. I think that cup was still in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But what it was is she grabbed her a big thing of ice water and was drinking it on the way to work. Okay, so if she's drinking this 32-ounce cup or whatever 
big cup of water and she's got half of that cup full of water in her stomach and then she suffers a severe head injury it's been my experience that the first thing that happens to people who get a bad head injury like that they start vomiting Mm -hmm. and they're in the passenger seat which is about where her face would have been pushed to in order for him to get into the car and drive off he's probably sitting halfway on her halfway in because she's still seat belted or whatever and he drags her out somehow or mm-hmm. she might have been sitting on the seat belt like they say cops do all the time they buckle it up so the alarm don't go off and then you just get in and out while you're sitting on top of it mm-hmm. that makes more sense than anything but if she's sitting on top of that thing and puts her face down and he climbs in and drives off if he's just suffered a severe head trauma there's a good chance she's vomiting mm-hmm. and then if she's face down and she's vomiting she's probably drawing a blank on the word but when you breathe it in aspirating there's a there's a chance she could have aspirated a couple times and breathed in a good portion of water yeah as she's vomiting and that explains the clear unidentified liquid in the floorboard that they found Mm -hmm. and it's listed in the thing if her face is down there and she's got a severe head injury i just assume when he says there's an unusually high amount of fluid in her lungs at the autopsy yeah. So she must have been drowned and she was breathing it in. It makes more sense to me that she was vomiting and aspirating water after yeah. this head injury. You know, when you're being strangled, you you probably do the same you, thing. You get some pulmonary edema, which yeah. is fluid in your lungs. So that, that makes way more sense than she was drowned in her tub. Mm-hmm. Because if she was literally drowned in her tub, then there would not be saliva from Rodney Reed on her neck and chest. Correct. Because Uh, the expert doctor witness uh, for the defense who testified in the trial said the saliva that was secreted on her neck and her breast and stuff like that was secreted onto her body after her last shower. Yeah. I just find it hard to believe a 19-year-old girl who's planning her wedding out and working extra shifts at H-E-B to pay for everything and all of the things that she was doing. She's getting married in two weeks. And then, oh, by the way, she's having a secret affair with this black guy named Rodney who just kind of walks the streets and sells crack and stuff over in in the bad neighborhood. And she met up with him. He even says now the day before, two days before, or whatever they've come up with. And she Mm -hmm. has consensual sex with him and she goes home. To her live-in fiancé, who's abusive, and, and if he found out, he would kill them both, and does not bathe. I just find that hard to believe. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it, that's just, I mean, when you're talking about reasonable yeah, articulation and, and the totality of the circumstance. Okay, Rodney's a known rapist. He's raped girls in the past. He's been violent. He's in the area that she went missing at the time when she went missing Mm -hmm. and that was his mo and you would always see him down at little longs is the little store right there about 50 yards down the street from the railroad tracks and the truck is found in the high school parking lot which is convenient for him yeah but not for jimmy finnell right down the road correct me if i'm wrong i don't know why this just popped into my head but is that not around the same place that they found linda schluter's car that is correct over there in the in the high school parking lot somewhere? That is correct. Okay. I don't know why that just popped into my head, but... Mm-hmm. Um, okay, yeah. so all of that that we're talking about. So he's got it in him. He's raped before, and he's done that and stuff. I personally believe that when Stacy came to and she found him, she probably gave him the what for and said, my husband-to-be whatever is a cop, and you are going to pay for this. Yeah. And he realized that she is not just... A little skinny white girl driving around, you know, fast drop trying to score drugs because that's what he would do to mm-hmm. those girls sometimes. This is somebody that is going to get me in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. And he had to take it to the next level. Yeah. Had Personally, no intention of killing her. She hurt him. I think she fought back. If she was conscious. It, to me, it strikes me more. That's what he that would enrage him. He's gotten out of criminal charges before. Yeah. But if she hurt him, he would become enraged. And strangling her to death with that belt, that was rage. Yeah, definitely. So. But something else, if you look at 
the investigator who went out to the scene, don't know her name, from DPS, she's the head lady, in her report, it says that the semen that was found inside of Stacy, this is another thing that really caught my eye in the recent years that I've been reading into this. Mm-hmm. She says, I have it photocopied somewhere. It says, due to natural drainage after natural intercourse, Stacy's body was never, she never stood up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she was laying down when he secreted the evidence into her. And then she never stood up after he did that. And he drug her over to the, or picked her up and carried her or, or however. Mm-hmm. Had she stood up, she words it, due to natural drainage after normal intercourse, the semen would have drained out of her and it yeah. had not done that. Correct. So, so it's when they say, well, they only found one sperm or whatever. No, they found a shot glass of that stuff in her mm-hmm. and they tested a couple, a couple swabs of it. Right. And that's what they're and saying. She hadn't stood up. That's another problem is that a lot of reads and reads experts are doing it too, is they're taking half of the information and saying it's all the information. What happened was they only quantified the modal what sperm on a couple yeah. of swabs, not every yeah. single swab that they took. Yeah. Well, you got to minimize. Yeah. The evidence is so overwhelming. They have done a really good job at minimizing. And telling their minimized story to people like Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil jumps on that bandwagon and says, well, we must have an innocent man on death row. And we've got to bandwagon this. And we're going to get all kinds of ratings. And we're going to have people jumping through their hoops. And they're going to listen to me. And mm-hmm. they're not going to do their own research. I find it hard, hard, hard to believe that Dr. Phil doesn't have a team of researchers before he goes and puts his reputation on the line. Now, granted, I get it. He's out for raids and stuff like that. And he probably thought, well, dude, we'll jump on this bandwagon and we'll get a bunch of ratings. I get it. I mean, he's in that business. But him as the self-proclaimed guru, he's the human lie detector. Human lie detector, yeah. I was like, surely you would not want to have to have a show and apologize for being wrong. He's not going to have a show for much longer because apparently he's ending his show. Dr. Well, Oz's show has ended, so perhaps pitching your wagon to Rodney Reed is not the best idea. Yeah. I was like, surely he has investigators who go and look into stuff, and they do some research. Well, the actor girl, oh, God, I'm drawing a blank on her name that I called earlier. She did enough research to tell her that she was wrong in signing. Amanda uh, Seals, yeah. Amanda Seal, yeah. She doesn't have a team of researchers, and she called BS on the whole thing. Certainly, they researched this. Something that I don't know that the general public realizes is Rodney Reed has a PR person, and that PR person circulates the latest bullshit pleadings yeah. over the internet. All Dr. Phil had was the bullshit pleadings that Rodney Reed's filed. Well... Then that's you know, his own fault. He didn't now, have, granted, he didn't in look his defense, at anything else. In his defense, he did reach out to Stacy's family. And at that point, they were not doing interviews. They said, no, we, if you want to know about the case, we're not going to talk about it. You know, this has just been a thorn in our side, whatever. And all he had to go on was what the Innocence Project gave him. Now, I think it would have been a little different if, if he had that same conversation now with uh, the Stites family and all that kind of stuff. And and you put the Stites family up there next to the Reed family and say, no, he did not know Stites. Everybody knew it. No, that's not true at all. He had the opportunity to hear the other side from Bob Phillips and he didn't listen. Yeah, well. That, that aggravates me too because you don't have to have the victim's literal family. You can have someone who advocates the other side of the yeah. story. And yeah. I mean, Facebook pages and, you know, YouTube videos and podcasts out there, you can find someone who advocates the other side of the story. He didn't look, yeah. he didn't want well, that's, the other side. Well, of the that's story. pretty much. That's and you don't have to have Stacy's family to give you that side of the story. Yeah. 
But I mean, he said, we reached out to the Stite family and they declined anything. And I'm like, well, I get it. They don't want to rehash yeah. this stuff yeah. over and over. If he ignored the multiple court opinions out there, if he ignored the transcripts of the trials and the transcripts of the hearings, the multiple hearings Rodney Reed has had because Stacy's yeah. family wouldn't talk to him, then he is an asshole. Yeah, well, that's his own. That's why I say there's there's got to be a research team, uh, <laughs> you know, that because they have people in Africa going to find the people that are that are taking advantage of people over here saying, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to move over there and send me money, send me money. And he's got, he's got reporters yeah, in Africa that will go out and find these people and call them out. Are, are you telling this lady that you're going to move over there? And they got some long arms and reach out and do some stuff, but I know it's for entertainment purposes mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. But I was like, surely you have read into this. Just <laughs> like Amanda seal did Amanda yeah. seal read into it. And about, an hour later, she's like, take my name off of that petition. Well, don't, don't get me started on dishonest TV producers, because then we'll have to start talking <laughs> about 2020. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> they're in it for ratings. If Rodney would have admitted what he did and stuff like that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So No. So I think it's probably better to go ahead and wrap it up now. Okay. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report. Thank you to Roberta for inviting me to sit in for it. And thank you to Tim for joining me to talk about one of the biggest and longest running innocence fraud cons in the media today. Good night.